are very few things that the entirety of the Naruto fandom agrees on. Everything from who's the strongest Uchiha in existence to how did the Senju disappear is hotly debated the second they're brought up. But that isn't to say that there isn't some things that the entirety of the Naruto fandom does agree on. We all agree that Itachi and Shisui deserved more screen time. We all agree that Jiraiya's death was the saddest. And we all agree that Kaguya, and therefore Madara, was mishandled by the story. See, while there are many great arcs in Naruto, some of which could be considered the greatest arcs in anime, period, the war arc is not one of those arcs. There are plenty of incredible moments throughout the duration of the war arc, but the general consensus around the war arc is that the massive amount of filler and the surprise twist ending that everybody hated kind of destroyed what could have been the greatest arc in the entire story. As many believe that the entirety of Naruto was building up to Madara unlocking all three Rinnegan and enacting the Eye of the Moon plan. However, in the moment that he achieves this thing that the story has been building towards for 670 chapters, he gets backshotted by a character who had less screen time and plot importance than Tauntaun. And thus the ending of Naruto left a lot of us with a bad taste in our mouth. And because of this, there's a large section of the Naruto fandom who wish Kaguya was never introduced and that Madara was the true final villain of Naruto like he was supposed to be. However, on the other side of that argument, there's an almost equally sized group in the Naruto fandom, most of which who now comprise the majority of the Boruto fandom, who feel as though, even though the reveal of Kaguya wasn't handled correctly, her reveal and the subsequent reveal of the beginning of the world and the creation of Chakra set up for a fantastic continuation of the Naruto universe in Boruto. Now, while I do technically exist in the latter camp, that is that I believe Kaguya's reveal, while flawed, did a great job of setting up the continuation of the Naruto universe story, I do feel that the setting up of that continuation did come at the cost of Naruto's ending, and thus, it was mishandled. But for a long time, those were the entirety of the thoughts I had on this matter. I'm happy the Otsutsuki are around, but I don't like how they were introduced. That is until I received quite possibly the best question I've ever gotten in an email a couple of weeks ago, which asked me the question, if you were writing Naruto, how would you have hinted at Kaguya's presence so it wasn't so abrupt and hated when she was revealed? And honestly, for the last couple of weeks, I've been stumped. But now that I've had some time to stew on it, ironically, I believe the best answer to that question lies with Boruto. Because if I'm correct in my assessment of where I believe Boruto's plot is going, which I usually am, I believe that Boruto is sending up an ending comparable to that of Naruto's, where the main antagonists, Kawaki, Code, and even possibly Jura, would be superseded in the danger hierarchy by the emergence of a much more powerful and dangerous foe. And that much more powerful foe will be Shibai, an Otsutsuki god who dwarfs all the previous antagonists in terms of total power. So essentially, what I'm saying is, in order to look at how Naruto could have been better written, we have to look at the current writing scheme of Kishimoto, who undoubtedly learned from the mistakes he made in Naruto and applied the learnings from those mistakes to his writing of Boruto. And the most important lesson that Kishimoto learned, that smoke, mirrors, and mysteries leave an open door to infinite possibilities. And it is exactly that line of logic that could have been applied to Naruto that could have saved the ending from the catastrophe that it was. And thus today, we're gonna be applying those smoke mirrors and mysteries to the Naruto storyline to make the reveal of Kaguya make a lot more sense. So with no further ado, let's get into rewriting Naruto. But before we get into rewriting anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like the idea of me getting creative with your favorite anime and manga, go ahead and follow my other channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto and Boruto, I talk all other anime and manga. And if you just like the idea of me talking anime and manga, you're gonna love my anime podcast, Otaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And if you just wanna look like somebody who keeps up with all things anime and manga, go ahead and meander on over into my merch store, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime t-shirts, sweatshirts, and sticker packs known to man. See, when you ask any Naruto fan what their biggest gripe is with Naruto, the majority of them are going to answer with something along the lines of when aliens randomly showed up with the ability to consume entire planets for power. Oh, and also when they killed one of the greatest antagonists of all time. And from that sentiment, we need to focus on two very important feelings. The first thing we need to focus on is the randomness with which the majority of the Naruto fandom feels Kaguya appeared with. As Kaguya's appearance felt like a literal god we knew nothing 
nothing about simply stumbling onto the battlefield to now battle against our main characters. The second thing we need to focus on is the fact that Kaguya's appearance came at the cost of Madara's death, which robbed every single Naruto fan of seeing what Brie Rinnegan Madara was truly capable of. For some cheap shock value and a small more argument revolving around Madara's character that those who are blinded by their lust for power are usually the most often misled, which is symbolized rather concretely by the fact that after Madara's body is released from Kaguya after she's sealed, that he is quite literally blinded. So, if we can focus on these two issues and assage the problems being brought forth, Kaguya can very easily be brought into the story in a way that people don't jeer at, but rather applaud. So the first point that we need to address is the randomness with which Kaguya appeared. And out of the two stress points that we're going to be addressing, this one is by far the most difficult. Because in order for Kaguya's arrival in the story to go from a what's happening here moment to a aha, I told you this was going to happen moment, we need to plant the seeds of her arrival long before the war arc. So how do you plant those seeds? Well, fortunately, it's fairly obvious. Do it in the same way that Boruto is planting seeds of Shibai's reappearance currently, by tying the abilities used by our main characters to suspicious and powerful outside forces. See, it's obviously easier for Boruto to hint at the reappearance of Shibai, because in Boruto, the idea of Utsutsuki isn't for it. And therefore, hinting at the idea that the final boss of Boruto is going to be the biggest and baddest Utsutsuki isn't hard. So in order to hint at the existence of all-powerful planet-eating aliens who see the world with chakra in naruto is a bit more of an uphill task but it's not impossible by any means especially when you consider the fact that sasuke the deuteragonist of this story or the co-protagonist is a wielder of the sharingan a technique that we can draw directly back to kaguya and thus the very first seed that we could have planted that the otsutsuki hagoromo hamura kaguya all exist would be something like a childhood sasuke awakening his sharingan for the first time and since we know that awakening your sharingan is a relatively unpleasant experience the awakening of sasuke's sharingan could be burning his eyes. And in a childhood fit of pain, Sasuke could yell at Fugaku and ask his father, why are we Uchiha cursed with these painful eyes? Which not only is a good introspective question into the history of the Sharingan, which is inherently rooted in pain, but also perfectly sets up Fugaku to do a little exposition dump on the history of the Sharingan. See, Fugaku was the leader of the Uchiha, and therefore is probably the most knowledgeable person about Uchiha clan history in the entirety of the current Uchiha clan. And thus, if in response to Sasuke's fit, Fugaku decided to sit Sasuke down and tell him about the history of the Sharingan and how the Sharingan were treasured, passed down from the god of Shinobi, the Sage of Six Paths himself, and how the Sharingan's power would assure that the Uchiha would continue to be one of the strongest clans on Earth for the rest of history, we would, incredibly early on in the story, establish that these modern-day abilities, like the Sharingan, have been around for thousands of years, not only showing us that the Naruto timeline is much vaster and greater than we even dreamed imaginable, but also would show us that at the beginning of this timeline was a godlike figure in Hagoromo who created the majority of the jutsu we see today. And now that we understand the scope of the history of the universe, Hagoromo and the Sage of Six Paths in that time period can become a relatively common talking point. A good secondary example of bringing Hagoromo's presence into the story relatively early on could be in a moment when Hiruzen is referred to as the God of Shinobi. See Naruto while milling about one day, possibly while painting glasses and a mustache onto Hiruzen's stone face in Konoha, but here Hiruzen being referred to as the god of shinobi. And thus, the next time that Hiruzen came to visit Naruto, Naruto could ask Hiruzen about this nickname, saying something to the effect of, I heard you're the god of shinobi, Gramps, but you look a little old and wrinkled to be a god to me. At which point, Hiruzen could laugh off the comparison and say that while the name is flattering, the real god of shinobi is Hagoromo, the sage of six paths. And the reason he's known as that is because he was the man who spread chakra to the entire entire world, and thus allowed for the creation of ninjutsu, and thus shinobi. And that Hiruzen is just a master of those ninjutsu that Hagoromo facilitated the creation of. Hiruzen could even go so far as to say that Hagoromo is actually the person who created the tailed beasts, one of which that is sealed within Naruto. To give Naruto more context on the reality of his situation and show him just how truly powerful the tailed beast that resides inside of him 
is. At which point you would create an incredibly interesting plot point for Naruto, who at this point in time greatly resents Kurama, as he was made his Jinchuriki against his will. And thus the resentment that Naruto holds towards Kurama and being his Jinchuriki could be transferred to the literal god of Shinobi, Hagoromo, who Naruto probably believes created the tailed beast to be a scourge on the earth. As so far as Naruto and basically the rest of humanity knows, that's exactly what the tailed beasts are, and therefore the person who created the these monsters must also be a monster of some sort. And thus, you get a pretty interesting opportunity for character development from Naruto when he realizes that the god of Shinobi is the person at fault for his current situation, which is a terrifying conclusion to come to. Now, you could possibly, possibly make the point that Hiruzen wouldn't know all this information, but Hiruzen was known as the Professor and has been around since the founding of Konoha. And while, yes, Hagoromo existed 2,000 years before the founding of Konoha, knowledge about the Sage of Six Paths is relatively commonplace, even though he's more viewed as a mythical, religious-esque figure. But that's not a bad thing, especially within the confines of what we're trying to accomplish today. Setting him up as a literal god paves the way for people like Kaguya and the rest of the Otsutsukis. In the same vein as these two moments, you could also write a plot point for Neji. That would happen possibly while Neji was receiving his curse mark on Hinata's third birthday. And Neji, while reeling in pain and wondering what he did to deserve this curse mark at the ripe age of three years old, when his cousin Hinata wasn't adorned with this curse mark, his father, Hisashi Hyuga, could tell Neji that they, as the side branch family, are burdened with the protection of the Byakugan, a gift handed down to them from Hagoromo, the Sage of Six Paths' brother, Hamura. He could go on to say that the Byakugan is a gift from the stars, and in that moment, the camera would pan to the moon, setting up an early connection between the moon and the Byakugan, setting up not only an eventual connection to Toneri, but also a connection to Hamura going to the moon to protect his mother's body, which was sealed there. And this would be eerily similar to what Kishimoto is doing with Mitsuki, who's constantly looking upon the moon, and thus people believe he's somehow connected to Toneri. And thus, in three simple conversations that take no time at all, all and do not divert the plot in any way whatsoever, you have set up a clear line of connection between Hagoromo and Hamura, to the Tailed Beast, the Sharingan, the Byakugan, and the creation of all Jutsu. And thus, in just a couple of short and quick conversations, you have set up Hagoromo and Hamura as massively important historical figures. But this still doesn't necessarily prep the fandom for the eventual return of Kaguya, and especially not through the medium of Black Zetsu. And in order to accomplish that feat, you need to make Black Zetsu a substantially more important character to the Naruto universe, because while Black Zetsu is kind of always around when it comes down to Akatsuki movements, he's never once hinted at to be an even remotely important character until he punches a hole in Madara. Therefore, as bad as Kaguya's reveal was, Black Zetsu being the mastermind behind it all was even worse. But see, Black Zetsu's character should be written more similarly to Eren's father from Attack on Titan, and I guess, therefore, by extension, kind of Eren from Attack on Titan. See, we all know that the reason that Madara ends up awakening the Rinnegan is because he takes a piece of Hashi Hashirama's flesh and binds it into one of the wounds that he gets when Hashirama kills him. And he does this to get Hashirama's healing factor and to awaken the Rinnegan, as by combining Indra and Ashura's chakra, he was able to recreate Hagoromo's chakra. And that was asinine. In fact, the majority of the reasoning behind anything that Madara ever did is asinine. See, Madara became aware of the Eye of the Moon plan from the Stone Tablet that Black Zetsu altered. And the only reason that Madara decided to ever study the Stone Tablet is because after the founding of Konoha, Madara realized that the government was being made mostly out of Senju. And thus, Madara believed that at one point or another, the Uchiha would be suppressed by Konoha. And thus, Madara realized that Konoha wouldn't be the bastion of peace that he hoped it would be. And because Konoha wasn't going to be his path to peace for some reason Madara was like okay you know it will be my path to peace the stone tablet at the Uchiha hideout and thus kind of out of nowhere Madara decides to start studying the stone tablet however unfortunately for Madara Black Setsu has altered said stone tablet to include stories about the eye of the moon plant and basically what it says on the stone tablet is if an Uchiha and a Senju combine their powers they're able to unlock the Rinnegan and use infinite Tsukiyomi which is the world's greatest power now it doesn't say anything about combining Ashura and Indra's chakra to make Hagoromo it literally just says that by combining the Uchiha and the Senju you can awaken 
the Rinne God. And it just so happens that the person reading this stone tablet is a reincarnation of Indra. And it just so happens that the person that he's definitely not kissing behind closed doors is an Ashura reincarnation. And so when Madara decides to haphazardly combine Hashirama's flesh with his own, probably not the first time if you know what I mean, he combines Indra and Asura's chakras, thus making Hagoromos, which leads to him eventually awakening the Rinnegan through complete and total luck. Oh yes, you could say, but Nick, it's his fate because he's Ashra's reincarnation and therefore he's stuck in the cycle of hatred more than anybody else. I don't care what rationale you use. Fate, luck, doesn't matter to me. It probably shouldn't have happened, which is kind of Madara's entire MO. And therefore, instead of hoping that Madara just stumbles his way through eventually bringing Kakia back to life, which somehow he does, introduce Black Zetsu, like an Amado-esque character who appears from the shadows of Izuna's corpse on the night of his murder and tells Madara that if he takes the eyes of his brother, he'll achieve a power that will finally allow him to overcome the strength of the Senju. And in this moment, set up Black Zetsu as an advisory, shadowy character who for some reason knows too much about the history of the world. Kind of like somebody in Boruto. Now after this, have Madara and Hashirama's plot continue in the way that it originally went, where Hashirama is eventually able to defeat Madara and they found Konoha. However, after Konoha was founded, don't have Madara fall out of love with Konoha because he thinks the Senju are going to suppress the Uchiha, which technically they do, which kind of does this thing to the plot where we all have to go, oh, Madara was kind of right about that, which isn't what we're supposed to be doing, and instead have Black Zetsu whispering into Madara's ear that Konoha is not the peace bastion that he wants it to be, that Hashirama and Tobirama have taken control of the entire village, and that soon the Uchiha will be their foot soldiers, and through the poking and prodding of Black Zetsu, have Madara slowly but surely fall out of love with Konoha. And once Madara has become more disgruntled with the way things are going in Konoha, have Black Zetsu tell him that the only way the world will ever know peace is if Madara enacts the plan that his elders concocted thousands of years ago. A plan they wrote down on a stone tablet. A stone tablet that Black Zetsu obviously altered to have the Eye of the Moon plan. And then have Madara go through his battle with Hashirama, grab a little bit of flesh, graft it onto his wound, awaken the Rinnegan, and summon the Ghetto Statue. But instead, when Madara realizes he can't complete his goals within the span of his own lifetime, and therefore deciding to give both of his Rinnegan to a child who knows nothing about Madara, in hopes that one day that child would bring Madara back to life in exchange for his own life, have Madara give one of his eyes to Obito, who at this point was half White Zetsu and therefore half Hashirama cells, and therefore more likely than not at that point in time had enough chakra and chakra control to wield one Rinnegan, and then give the other Rinnegan to Nagato, and that way Madara's got two separate people who could at some point or another bring him back to life. One of which, he's already got his hooks in. On top of this, Obito needs another eye. And on top of this, since the side of Obito that needs another eye is White Zetsu, technically it's under control of Black Zetsu. But Nick, wouldn't that make Nagato a much weaker antagonist? Probably not. We've never actually seen having two Rinnegan confer any actual benefit, as both Sasuke and Madara showed us that with just one Rinnegan, they were able to use all of the paths of the Rinnegan. The only benefit that we've ever seen conferred by getting an additional Rinnegan is Madara getting more Limbo clones. On top of this, if Obito and Nagato both had one Rinnegan, Obito would have much more magnetism towards Nagato to convince him to join the Akatsuki and go for the Eye of the Moon plan. And thus, from the jump, Black Zetsu has some semblance of control of one of the Rinnegan he needs, and Madara's now got double the chances to come back to life. Then, show Madara telling Black Zetsu to keep an eye on both Obito and Nagato, setting up Black Zetsu as a clear mover and shaker in the Eye of the Moon plan. However, we as a fandom aren't entirely sure what his intentions are and why he's so invested in the Eye of the Moon plan actually happening. Why is he helping Madara? From here, all you need to do is hit the time skip. I guess technically all this was told to us after the time skip, and have Naruto begin his training in sage mode with the toads on Mount Muabuko, who, mind you, trained Hagoromo. And now that Naruto is conflicted with his connection to Hagoromo, as he believes that Hagoromo is this evil god who cursed him with the fate of carrying his strongest tailed beast, simply have the great toad sage, who was the person who trained Hagoromo, bring up his name, possibly while talking about Naruto being the child of prophecy. Or possibly just have the great toad sage say that Naruto reminds him of Hagoromo, who he trained. At which point, Naruto would say something along the lines of, you trained that monster? He created the tailed beast to destroy humanity. Or something 
something like that. At which point the Toads would realize that Naruto has a massive misconception of who Hagoromo is and what he did for humanity, and therefore they would take Naruto to their Truth Stone, which is a giant stone tablet that exists in Mount Muabuko that has the entirety of human history on it. And it's actually through this Truth Stone, if I'm remembering correctly, that we learned about Hagoromo training with the Toads in the first place. This bumps up that timeline by a couple of hundred episodes. Now, the important takeaway from all of this is that the Truth Stone has the entirety of human history on it, of which Hagoromo and Hamura battling against Kaguya is most definitely included. He would realize that Hagoromo, who was his character of controversy to Naruto for the majority of his story, is actually one of the greatest heroes that humanity ever knew. Now that Naruto better understands Hagoromo and the role he played in human history, as he now knows that him and his brother battled against their mother for three straight months to seal her in the moon, he can begin to realize that Hagoromo is more like a father figure to the tailed beasts, a godlike figure who gave them ego from an entity that didn't, that being the Ten Tails. And with this newfound knowledge, Naruto can begin to find connection to Kurama, who, as we all know, loved Hagorama with the entirety of his heart. And we now, from these five incredibly simple changes to the plot, know about Kaguya and her connection to Hagorama and Hamura, the existence of godlike aliens who created Chakra and therefore Ninjutsu thousands of years ago, and that Black Zetsu, for some reason, is trying to set up the Eye of the Moon plan. On top of this, since the Toads would absolutely be able to tell Naruto about the ghetto statue and it being sealed on the moon and thus Hamura going to the moon to keep an eye over said ghetto statue, we could draw a connection between the ghetto statue we see in this flashback being told to Naruto and the ghetto statue that we eventually see or did previously see Madara summon. And thus in that moment, those of us who are able to draw connections between things would all become aware that the Nine Tails were originally the Ten Tails and that Ten Tails was absorbed into Hagoromo who used his creation of all things ability to split that massive chunk of power into nine-tailed beasts. And we know that Hagoromo had to do this because his mother was able to merge with this ten tails to become a massively powerful entity that he had to battle against for three months. Therefore, when him and his brother Hamura were able to separate Kaguya from the ten tails and seal her in the moon, they had to dispose in a safe way of this massively powerful entity. However, when Hagoromo absorbs this ten tails, it leaves the husk of the ten tails behind, the ghetto statue, which we now know is summonable with the Rinnegan and is in the possession of Obito, or Madara, or Nagato, or Black Zetsu. And thus, while it's not laid out in giant neon letters that Black Zetsu was the will of Kaguya trying to facilitate her return, the idea of Kaguya, Hagoromo, Hamura, the Rinnegan, and the Ghetto Statue all tie into Black Zetsu somehow. And it's up to us as anime sleuths to try and figure out what that connection is. Why is Black Zetsu so invested in the Eye of the Moon plan, and what does it have to do with Madara, or the Uchiha? Smash cut to the war, when Madara finally uses Infinite Tsukiyomi. In the moment that everybody's eyes turn into Rinnegan and the Divine Tree starts to wrap everybody up and turn them into White Zetsu, we cut to Black Zetsu, who begins to maniacally laugh. Not near Madara, so Madara can't hear him, and as we see Black Zetsu maniacally laughing, we begin to pan up towards the sky, where we can see a crack begin to form on the moon, currently reflecting Infinite Tsukiyomi. But there is no immediate payoff, because if we assume that Black Zetsu is actually Kaguya's comma marking, and thus when Black Zetsu stabbed Madara through the chest, he was actually marking Madara with his comma marking and therefore making him a vessel for Kaguya, which is kind of how things went down in Naruto, then if we're rewriting Naruto, then we're also rewriting the fact that Black Zetsu has the AP to punch through a three Rinnegan Madara. Because even though Black Zetsu did take Madara by surprise, that was an ass pull of the highest order. So if we're approaching the moment of Black Zetsu turning Madara into Kaguya through the medium of making him a vessel by planting a comma marking on him through a more fan approved and logical angle, the most logical approach would be for Black Zetsu to wait until Madara was down and out, to strike when Madara was weakest not strongest. You see, because in the moment that Black Setsu decided to turn Madara into a vessel, Madara was as strong as he had ever been. He was approaching Kaguya level of strength, and thus Black Zetsu has to bide his time. He has to wait for Team 7 to put Madara in a compromising position. And thus, instead of three running on Madara getting backshotted by Black Zetsu, instead Team 7, those unaffected by Infinite Tsukiyomi, would rally together like they rallied together in their battle against Kaguya and defeat three running on Madara. Or at least 
get really close to defeating him. However, right before they're about to deliver the killing blow, Black Zetsu, like he did to Obito after Obito lost the Ten Tails, flies in and binds to three Rinnegan Madara's body. At which point, Black Zetsu takes the hand that he's controlling on three Rinnegan Madara's body and punches it into his own chest, facilitating the rebirth of Kaguya like he did in the original storyline. At which point, we pan up to the moon that's reflecting the infinite Tsukiyomi and we see that the crack is running all the way across it and that Kaguya has now been released. And now, and only now, does Kaguya descend into the story, a god whose existence has been foreshadowed and didn't overshadow Madara's time to shine. As Madara had to be defeated at the peak of his powers by the main characters who have been hyped up to join this fight since the beginning of Naruto, and thus Naruto is given the ending it deserves plus the encore of a battle against Kaguya, which is objectively a really cool fight. However, it's mired by the fact of how it started. So now the Naruto fandom doesn't look at Madara as a wasted antagonist, but instead as powerful as everybody dreamed he would be. However, there was somebody more powerful behind him pulling the strings, which is kind of what we did with Obito to Madara, but now it's revealed that Madara was also being manipulated by Black Zetsu, which was always the reveal, but now it's a good payoff. And thus the battle against Kaguya and the rest of Naruto pans out in the exact same way, just now Madara got his time to shine. The added benefit of everyone loving this ending is also that it would cement once and for all that Three Rinnegan Madara is weaker than Kaguya, as while Team 7 could kill Three Rinnegan Madara, they had to seal Kaguya. And that is how I would rewrite Naruto to make Kaguya's appearance more palatable. But I'm curious to hear what you guys think. If you had to approach this same task, how would you go about it? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Imagine Kishimoto didn't learn from his mistakes, and when Shibai's revealed at the end of Boruto, he actually gets punched through the stomach and Kaguya once again appears. I have to admit, I would kind of love that. <laughs>